So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is the 20th meetup that we've had with the Chicago Hadoop User Group. And uh, on behalf of the other organizers and myself, um, we want to thank everybody here for all the different meetups um, that you've attended. We're really glad that you're here. All the contributions and all the speakers. would also like to thank um, Allstate, uh, Matt Barr for the pizza and for Ted coming in. We had a uh, all state uh, HR representative recruiter here that was outside that you may have met. Uh, thanks again uh, for coming in. Um, and I think I think I'll keep it short since we're we started just a few minutes late. We're broadcasting this a uh, handful of people on the internet. They'll be asking questions um, only from the keyboard, and uh, Ted will be broadcasting. Um,
That's exactly what we want. So something that's as good as to do at querying long-term data, but looks like it's up to the second. So here's a second, an example. I'm going to show just a simple example, but it has at its heart the basic ideas that are needed here. And I'm going to show some of the tricks that are used to maintain that that uh, persistence in a way that the long-term aggregation player can use. Uh, so we, we, we've got some real-time constraints. It isn't real-time unless we make it. That's what real-time is. So let's make them guaranteed. Uh, two seconds response, 99.9% .9 of the time, meaning almost always. And uh, less than 30 seconds when things get bad, like we lose a node or things have to fail over. And that, that leads us up to almost always, where things like fault in the hole or something like that. And we just won't consider that, but we'll put a bound on how likely the really horrible things are. And almost never is a reasonable approximation. Probably something like five nines or whatever, or mean time between failure of 100 years or something. Whatever a data center can guarantee us. And those are pretty good. And of course, we need to work over a wide range of speeds from very slow queries per second to very fast. And we need to be failure tolerant, of course, and keep a long-term thing like a year or more. So here's a rough design. We're going to pretend that we're getting data from a search engine. How many queries per second? What we're going to try to compute. And we inject that into Storm. And the injection point in a Storm, Storm has a system where you have blocks that communicate. And the ingestion block is called a spout. It messages to these little action blocks that are called bolts. I think that David Marks is jealous of the pig community. Pig community has the highest productivity within any community for tons per square meter. And so Nathan is trying to catch up here by saying bolts and storm and things like that. And then all of these things, when they're glued together, form a topology. The topology is imposed on a cluster, and, and different components have different replications for handling throughput. And in this diagram, what I've shown is red arrows for high bandwidth, high frequency, potentially, uh, length, and dotted lines for where the frequency, the bandwidth, drops dramatically. And the idea here is that the spout is replicated, so it can be pulling data from many in, in uh, invocations of the search engine. The counter bolt is replicated so that it can be counting different things on different machines. But once we do counting, we're going to assume that the counting operation itself compresses the data. So if the data is coming in very fast, then there must be a lot of things to count and compression happens. Uh, if you've got a, a million things come in, you count them, you have a seven digit number that's compressed that million events very nicely. If they come in rarely, then we don't care if it doesn't compress because it's not very high bandwidth. Either way, the output of the counter bolt is fairly low data rate, unless we have a high rate of very unique things coming through. But let's pass on that for now. And the output of then uh, the counter bolt goes to a logger, and we just do that so that the output is, is uh, easily connected to different things. You might put it out to a logger or to another uh, aggregator or something like that. And the logger bolt is just going to drop out to a file, semi-aggregated ones. The idea with semi-aggregation is that it will have a timestamp on it. It will have a window indicated which time period the, the aggregation belongs to, the symbol that's being counted and the count. But there isn't any implication that that's the full count for that window. And by dropping out semi-aggregated things at moderately high frequency, we can make sure that the amount of state we have to the memory is limited. Makes it so we can recover in the event of a node failure more rapidly. Now the view layer is going to have to aggregate those semi-aggregated lines together, add them up, so that it gets a total to display, but the semi-aggregates are okay. And then what we're going to do over on the right there, and I'll, I'll point with the, the pointer there. Uh, we're going to take a snapshot so that we can now start the Hadoop aggregation on static data. 
if the data were changing underneath the Ecadoo program, we wouldn't necessarily know how much data was processed. Because and the new program started and the time that it actually committed to different splits to the time that the processes ran and the last mapper read as far as it felt like reading, which is the end of file. We wouldn't know just how much data got included in the thing. So a snapshot is important there because we can later look at the very end of that snapshot in file and we can see the last timestamp that was reported by the logger. That last time step is an exact bound on when real time begins. So what we'll do is later when we ask the real time engine how to what what data to display, we will make sure that we tell it display data only after that last time stamp in the to process data. And we know that because it's a snapshot, the data doesn't change during the course of that to do the program running. We know it process only the data that was snapshot. And the data itself tells us that. And then the Hadoop aggregator keeps long-term aggregations, which are also probably semi-aggregates for very long periods, but are full aggregates for the shorter term periods. The counter bowl is a simple thing. It just gets labels to count as its input. Its output is short-term semi-aggregates with a time window, probably a timestamp as well, a label and a count. That's easy. And it emits any non-zero uh, counts if it reaches a flush horizon or if it reaches the time, if the, or if the, uh, the event count gets large enough. And these tuples in the, the, one of the characteristics of storm is that when things come in through a spout, these tuples pass through the system. They're tracked, and all of the children tuples that they create are also tracked. And ultimately, when they're emitted, they're acknowledged. And if they're acknowledged within a time guarantee, which we'll set short, then they will not be re-emitted. But if they're not emitted within that time guarantee, the spout has a choice what to do, and it typically will re-emit those because the assumption is some node somewhere has failed. So we will process them again. We get at least one guarantee that way. Well, we don't want these tuples to be hanging fire for a long time. We want the, the, the real-time guarantees to be all short. So we want that time to live to be very short. And that's the goal of this time since last count by threshold, so that we don't keep data in memory too long. We go ahead and flush it out. So then we have guarantees that if we don't flush something out within a short period of time and acknowledge the tuples, we will re-emit them and we will flush that out. And since we know which tuples and when that goes out, we can guarantee that we don't have double counting, although there is a very small window when that could happen. Uh, counters are emitted for the same label, the same window, many times. That's why they're called semi-aggregations. And that's a feature. That's what allows us to keep these tuples, their residency and memory short, and allows us to have the, the sharp real-time guarantees before we set, you know, no worse than two-second delay. We know that we're going to re-emit those tuples very quickly if we have a node failure. And so that's part of the, the key uh, real-time design. And we also know that the tuples will be react within a second or so. But that means that the time windows, like if we're counting the number of queries per week, the time windows can actually be very long. So we'll be putting out those semi aggregates fairly often, but we'll put those together either in Hadoop or in the presentation layer. And we uh, don't have to send the same label always to the same bulk. We can do random distribution. The semi aggregation handles that as well because we will just get the two bulk counts for the two bulk. They'll both in a semi-aggregated result. And again, the presentation layer will deal with that. The counter, on the other hand, can do some other tricks. It can keep a short-term transaction log. We wanted to set that, that, uh, that flush window out to a longer time, say 10 seconds or 30 seconds, in order to get more counts and more compression. 
what we could do then is we could have it keep a transaction log during that time period so that if it fails, if somebody else takes over, whoever takes over would reread that transaction log, get the state, start catching two bullets. It would get all of the same two bullets anyway, and then it would emit that flush interval. And as soon as it persists the things to the transaction log, it can acknowledge them. So we can have even sharper real time guarantees. But of course, until we get to the window, we're not going to emit, emit the semi aggregate. So if we only look at the file system, our view layer will be out of date. We would have to probe the bolts themselves to find out what the counts are. Now, there are some evil things that we could have done here. Uh, we can't accumulate the entire period in memory. Because if we designed it that way, then it would be very sensitive to failure. Uh, and the reason is because we have to make the window for acknowledging tuples very long, and it would quit being a real-time system. It's no good if a week later it says, oh my god, they never acknowledge that tuple on Monday. That's just inconceivable. There. So we can't do that. And also the state could grow enormous, which is just not feasible in a real-time sort of thing. And so we also can't persist the entire count table either. We need to persist it incrementally, and that's another reason for doing these flush buffers. Now, remember, real time is about guarantees. So we have to have guarantees from the underlying substrate so that we can make guarantees to the consumer. Uh, we know that the counter output is pretty small, and that means it's you know, going to be 100,000 because we've got a lot of tuples, or it's going to be one second worth of counts. And we know that we're going to have about one tuple per second per label for that. That's probably moderate. That's a nice thing that we can make, is that we can bound the size of the output. And then we also have to have layer, persistence layer guarantees. We have to say that the persistence layer has to be robust against failures because we're guaranteeing that. They have to guarantee it to us. We also have to have a um, readable flush. That means if we write and we flush, Anybody who's reading, who has that file open, has to read that data. Sense. And in particular, the snapshot, well, snapshots have to exist, and the snapshot has to include anything that we flush before the snapshot happens. Now, the alternative is that we close the file every time we want to flush, and then reopen it, and append that would require a pen down to close. Neither of those guarantees are possible in HDFS, which is a problem. But in FRFS, I'm wearing the right hat, so it's okay to say this sort of thing, uh, provides both of us. It's HDFS compatible. It provides a, a compatible substrate for two programs, but it gives both of those real-time guarantees. And that's a, a key to this real-time, long-time integration is that you have to have those guarantees. Failure mode. Again, if we're going to make guarantees, we have to figure out how things break. If a bolt fails, then the unactive people that have been buffered will, will not be active, and they will be resent. After the timeout, the people that get resent will be recounted by whoever replaces us, and then they'll be put out. Uh, if we set the timeout to 10 seconds or 3 seconds or something that's long relative to our flush window, then we should be good to go. Now, if the failure occurs after we write the, the semi-aggregate and before we aggregate, we acknowledge the two folds that are in that semi-aggregate, we have a little tiny window where we can double count those. But these are consecutive lines of code, so it's very unlikely that we're going to have a failure right there. And so we just say in our guarantees, except right there, we will have an accurate count. Um, in the uh, storage layer, most of the failures are invisible. They just fail over transparently. We see no delays or anything like that. There are a few which could take a two second or so. We have a very active file system. We have to nominate a new master to roll back three things. You get a few second hold, and then it goes ahead. If you get a catastrophic cluster failure, you could have a two, three minute delay before certain failovers can, can be recognized. Those are very unusual events, and they usually mean several nodes have failed at once. In fact, uh, one of the specs is that a disorganized 
cluster down, disorganize the cluster of them. It's guaranteed to restore function within 10 minutes. And normally, it comes back within two minutes. So that's where the two to three cluster problems is. Higher cluster has gone down, has come back up, just whoosh, all at once. Then we may get a two second, three, or I'm sorry, two or three minutes away. But of course, the bolts will have gone down and the spout and the search engine in that same scenario. So we're not too worried about that situation. And if it does happen, the logger could buffer that much if it survives the failure. The presentation layer then has to read recent output of the logger. It may have to probe the live bolt if we've got a long flush option. And it has to read the correct output of the new player. And it has to combine any semi-aggregated results on the fly and then present them probably as a nice little bar graph, you know, how things go. And the counts uh, will, the user will see, as soon as they can refresh, the counts will continue to update. And if they do a query on this side and they look at the counts over here, time between the query and the count incrementing will be less than a few seconds. Uh, we, we have a seamless meld there also. They won't see counts bobble as they cross the, the boundary to the real time versus long time thing. Picture wise, uh, this sort of architecture actually becomes important in uh, real applications. And one real application of that is these guys. Mobile phone operators care a lot about whether or not their cell towers are still running. Well, immediately on a cell tower failure, they need to route traffic around it. And very shortly, they need to get a, a repair team to that tower. And they often have a repair team very close by. So all cell phones burp every 30 seconds or so. And then there's some aggregation layer, which within a few seconds of this burping, needs to aggregate and notice it doesn't just notice that the burp happened. It has to notice something that's missing. So if my cell phone is here and I want to shut the room, it may lose some cell tower. It may gain another one. Everybody suddenly stops mentioning a particular cell tower. That indicates a failure. So they have to detect quickly that everybody in the world has stopped mentioning a particular cell tower. And their specifications of what they would like to do if within 30 seconds they'd like to know and respond. But using the architecture we just showed, we can build something very similar to what we have. We have transaction data, we have the real time red nodes and batch aggregation going there, and we can get a real time dashboard against the long term and the short term. And it can actually make those decisions faster than they're able to make them now using open source and very simple components. And of course, you also get then the ability to do long-term retro analysis. Any questions about that? Typically, what I do in this situation is I assign questions. So if you don't have something, you can do it. Yeah, there you go. The brave people who are online <laughs> may have some questions, not these people who are in person. Yeah, yeah, there you go. In 10 days, you can so uh, the question is, you, you mentioned about some guarantee that my understanding was that only MapR is so guaranteed. Well, not only MapR, but when you compare MapR versus HDFS. Now, so we're looking at things that support the do. There aren't very many file systems that support it. Uh, considering the two most prominent, there's MapR and there's HDFS. HDFS does not make any of these promises. HDFS promises to run the new program and nothing else. So does that mean that we can use formula or use formula that won't have that guarantee that it won't work as well? Absolutely. I'm trying to understand exactly what we you lose the ability to read data that has recently been written. And, and that is the key to this working correctly. If it's something that has been written, is gone. If it's been forgotten from memory. And if the Hadoop program doesn't read that, 
then you have this gap. Yeah, well, you, you can do even stranger things. You can have the data in the real-time part, and then it disappears. And then uh, the one-hour version, the, the ag aggregate in the two, doesn't see it. But one hour later, if you rerun the aggregation, it will see it. So you, you have this twinkling effect where the data is never quite what you know. It, it, it always is changing. And um, the other effect that you have is that you, um, you have single points of failures. So you have much higher probability of long delays and possibly gain of loss. So these are guarantees. And then, of course, there's, there's, it's not a guarantee. It is a guarantee. I can guarantee that HDFS doesn't have snapshots. Uh, and that snapshot is critical for getting a clean boundary between real time and long time. And if you don't have a clean boundary, you don't know which side an event sits on. And if you don't know that, then you may count it twice or you may never count it because you may think it's on the long term side and may try to aggregate it, but in fact it's still on the real time side. And then in the next period, you think it's in that period, but in fact it was in the previous period. So without synchronization guarantees about the file system, you can't do, you can't even count. Now, I find counting quite difficult, uh, that's why I'm not a swimmer, that's because you have to count last. I, I'm a binary guy, I count to two, uh, that's about it. Uh, but but I, I use computers to count quite often, they do it much better than I do. But it, it's extremely difficult to do the counting right, precisely, at high rate. You have to really be careful to design well. Well, I guess it's that if you're swimming, there's no need to turn two laps. But. I, as far as I can tell, that's how I ever swim. Okay. <laughs> it takes a long time, and I can go in there for a very long time. Yeah. We have a question from the Internet, and the question is from uh, Sanjay um, Yermalko. Um, and Sanjay, Sanjay says, um, are the both executional pieces inside the Duke, or are they separate servers, much like Zookeeper? They're separate. And uh, there are two kinds of servers in a, in a star topology. There's Nimbus, another kind. That's pretty cool. He's up to two, uh, way behind the table. So, uh, but Nimbus is an overall controller. And it talks to the zookeeper. It does a leader election in zookeeper to decide who's the Nimbus of choice. And then it assigns which worker nodes handle which bolts. Replicas of bolts go where. And then there are workers who read Zookeeper and look for changes in Zookeeper for their assignments, and they instantiate different goals. Now, these are not a due process, but they can be managed by general purpose frameworks. Uh, and there, there are many of those that manage tasks across a cluster, and that far is one of them. Well, there's nothing too special about that. We like it. It's fun. But, uh, but there's lots of ways to manage that. Um, we have time for one more question. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, so, uh, Chen Hei, uh, also on the webcast, wants to, wants to know, um, in your first several slides, it said there was unprocessed data. And he's curious why it is not processed. Ah. Well, I may mean, have to go back and look, but my guess is that what we're talking about there were uh, data that had not, oh, oh, this is from the very first few slides. Yes, so the, the, the most recent window, which has not completed yet, has obviously not been processed by Hadoop, but Hadoop processes things when a window completes. But even the, the, the full period before that, is not processed until the Hadoop process that processes it completes. So there's a period of time where the last full period and some of the current period has not been processed yet. And then at once that Hadoop process finishes, then only the current period is not processed. We get to the end of that Hadoop process, we get the one and a fraction of the process data. And this is inherent in a batch process. The whole idea of batch is we run it every so often, and until we run it, we have it run it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I made it happen. I think it did. Good, good. So what I want to talk about next is um, 
is another example of this real-time sort of processing, but it uses um, new algorithms, old algorithms actually, they first published in the 30s, but new applications of these old algorithms and new implications of these algorithms. And the idea is that we want to do real-time learning. And a particular kind of real-time learning also involves selecting which training data to pick. And the idea is that by picking the right training data, we can avoid learning about things that are just not good enough to ever apply to our world. And we can only learn about the things that are nearly good enough. And at the same time that we're learning about these, we can, we can then be selecting. We don't pay opportunity costs on the things we're learning about. So it's, uh, a great example of that is you've got a website. Um, you've rolled 15 versions of the website. You've assigned people at random to this testing or something. And you get a conversion or a sale within a certain time window. And so you have an impression when somebody sees the website, and you have some time at which you decide that it succeeded or failed at getting a conversion. And some of the versions of the landing page are horrible, some of them are excellent, and they, you don't want the horrible versions to get the traffic because they're horrible. You want to give the good version traffic. All right, this is slight side step here. And so uh, we're going to try to do that. And we have real-time constraints because it's a real-time talk, so we have to make promises. We want selection to happen very fast so we don't slow down the website. We want training events to be handled very quickly because they're pipeline. We want to keep those uh, from backing up. We want any failover to happen within five seconds. And the client that's sending the data or asking for a selection should back off and you know make a default answer. And after a very short time, like 500 milliseconds, if the uh, selector doesn't answer, it's going to go half or take it random. So that means that in a failure, we fail safe very quickly, and then we won't try for a while. We'll try again if the system has recovered we continue operating. Uh, we don't want to slow down the whole website We're waiting for a timeout on every query if we're getting 100,000 of those per second. Because very soon, everything falls over. Rough design then is we have a selector layer and a conversion detector. These are both spouts in the system, and or they, they both go into the DRPC and the distributed arm. So what the feature called spout. We have the times join. So we have the selector coming in for the selection, and uh, that's going to sit there, say, a minute or an hour. And then we have conversions coming in, and they join up against those impressions, if we have an ID match, if it's still there within the hour. And if they don't join up with anything, they just get discarded. And so at the time that those impressions time out, we know we got a conversion or not. The time joined I put stuff out to a logger bolt and also to a model. Now, let's just uh, a little bit of version here. If you see a coin, you know, see a coin, I hope to the web. So the coin is a head and a tail, and I could ask somebody, you, what's the probability of heads and tails? Yeah, you. Why do you say that? Why else do you say that? Why don't you say it's going to be heads? Okay. I'm, I'm going to flip the coin, and while it's in the air, I want you to tell me what's the probability of heads. Uh, you have to go faster. Okay, ready? <laughs> okay, do you say half? Why, why does she say half? Why did you say half? Because you didn't know, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, it's fallen in my hand. It is now heads or tails. No longer some bizarre physics that, that is going to result in something. It is there. It is one or the other. What's the probability of this? I look at it. I know. What's the probability of heads or tails? 
That's a little bit harder to say, but what? Not for me. <laughs> so you know that that's the answer you'll give, and you know it's not the answer I'll give, but you don't know which answer I'll give. What's the probability? I'll say one. Oh, yeah. So what's the difference between us other than I'm a ham and you're not? I know. Exactly. That's the key. And that is first conclusion here. Probability as expressed by humans is equivalent of knowledge or ignorance. The way for them saying, I don't know. That's a big thing. And in certain mathematical departments around, you'll get big trouble for saying that. Because you all are now official Bayesians. <laughs> Suck you in. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't even know. You've been co-opted. You are now fellow travelers. And it, it was tales, by the way. Now wait a second. Yeah. She, you still say half, even though I said tales. Oh. Yeah, I know. I just threw it again. So which one is it now? You always should regain a little bit of probability for a third option. Okay. So we have a single number, though, is, is a bad way to express your ignorance. But I remember after I flipped it and I looked at it, you still said half, but it, it didn't feel quite right because you knew it wasn't really half. It wasn't really that you knew nothing about what I would say. You knew I would say zero or one. So there's this distribution of values might be better. So this is, I don't know. Could it be anything? That means you've never seen a coin before. You know, it turns out it's really hard uh, to take a coin and make it be biased. It, you know, if you bend it, then it can be biased. But actually weighting a coin or, or filing and things like that, almost nothing will bias a coin. So it, you, you have some presupposition that it's really close to a half, unless a guy like me is flipping it. You know, I can say, take it be heads or tails as I like. You know, yeah, heads, there it is. Uh, that, that works just fine. Uh, but if you see five heads and five tails, and you have some idea, well, you have many ideas, an infinity of them, uh, but you know that the probability zero, probability one, are no longer possible, because you've seen both kinds. And you know that there's kind of some position there. Or if you see two heads and ten tails, you know it's really rather concentrated down, down around the lower probability. You don't know that it's low probability. It might be 0.5. You don't think so. So you, you get more knowledge from experience. That's another thing we can conclude. Now, another thing we can do, and this will come in handy, is not only can we express this knowledge by a distribution that's kind of bunched over to one side, we can also do things like what's the most probable value? What is the average value? What are the extreme values? And we can also say sample. Give me a sample from this distribution. And if I take a sample from that distribution, I might get a very low value, and I might get a pretty high value, but I'll probably get something kind of near the peak. But the fact that I could get a high value is key. So we have the problem that we had before we started playing with coins and being silly. The, the problem was that we want to do learning about which website variant is best. It's like flipping a coin, except we don't know the bias of any of them. And so we have 15 coins in front of us. We have to decide which one to flip, which one should we flip. And that's the Bayesian banded algorithm. It's also called random probability matching by Google. It's being used by Google. It's being used by Microsoft, by Yahoo. It's a very cool algorithm. So what we do is we compute these distributions based on what we've seen. What knowledge do we have? What distribution should we impute as to the, the, the probability that's underlying there? And then we sample the probability of, in this case, two heads, two coins. Sample it. Don't estimate it. Sample it. And whichever one is sampled as higher, we flip that coin, and now we, we try again. Now, that idea of sampling is weird because we might have a pretty good estimate that this, this, this one over here sucks. And we might have a, 
an, an, you know, pretty good estimate that this one here is good, and we might have no idea about the third one, but well, we kind of have a 50-50 chance of taking the third one we have no idea because it, it could sample high, it could sample low, or the really kind of sucky one might sample high and the good one might sample low, so we would still give some bandwidth to the sucky version, <coughs> but we give a lot of bandwidth to the known pretty good version, and when we introduce a new thing that we know nothing about, it'll get bandwidth for a little while until we decide if it's bad or very good or about the same as what our best is now. And so each time the algorithm picks a suboptimal choice, then, you know, if you knew the true probabilities, there's some opportunity cost. And if it picks the best option, there's no opportunity cost. If it picks the best. On average, if it always picks the best, there will be no regret. If it picks the suboptimal thing, there will be some regret each time it picks the suboptimal one. And so we can plot this declining regret for these two coins, two coins that I picked probabilities at random and then flipped them with this experimental thing. And as the thing learns, it more and more often picks the best one and less and less often picks the one that it will regret picking. And that's a little greedy here. It was recently shown in a, a nice empirical thing. That's the red graph. That was shown to be very nearly optimal yeah, for this particular problem. Uh, but the basic band is substantially outperforms it. And there was another evaluation by people at Yahoo who showed similar results, that the, the basic band, even theoretically, relative to the guarantees, uh, if you sum these up, the best that this algorithm can do is total regret that grows with the log of the number of trials, and indeed that is within a constant found that the Bayesian band is. Well, this is exciting. And the basic idea is that we can encode this distribution as, or, uh, by sampling. So we, we compute the distribution of what we're uncertain about, whether, you know, what's the probability of conversion or, or something like that. And then what we do is we do that sampling trick, and then the rest of it is all deterministic code. It's all simple, including the human part of buying or not buying. We don't have to do some Schrodinger's cat to every web visitor where we clone them probabilistically and quantumly and show them all the different versions of the website. We don't have to make the whole process probabilistic. We sample at the beginning, and that carries through all the way to the result, and then feeds back around, even with delay, and gives us very nearly optimal results. And in fact, the complexity of this, to get those, those curves that we showed, did ago, these posterior distributions, which has nothing to do with that, but uh, those distributions are encoded just by counting the number of successes and counting the number of failures. That's enough data to to compute this first. So we have a very small amount of data, and we have a very easy update rule, a very simple sampling rule, and bam, Bob's your uncle is the thing you're supposed to say at this point. And so we can also extend it to more elaborate response models. So the coins might have labels on them. You know, I am a bench coin, or something like that. But we might have data about them. So we know that this has red on this label and it has red on this label and there's a whole bunch of variants that have this red label and then there's that blue label. Now all of the red things might have a similar effect. They might have some correlating effect with other, some other variant. So instead of just 15 versions of the language, we might have five characteristics or three characteristics call it two, two one three-way characteristics, one five-way characteristics of these. And it might just be one of those three-way characteristics that really drives the conversion. The other five characteristics of the second, the values of the second characteristic might not matter at all. It might have some factorable thing. We might have ten binary decisions for our website, which would express a thousand different possibilities. It might be just a few of those variables that really, really matter. We would have a label standard. We might be able to learn general properties of those labels, how they influence the probability. And the way we would do that is we would learn a model that connects the labels 
to the probability, the same idea is in some way applied. We can even extend it further where we get labels from the band and we get context. Context would be the person visiting. What country are they visiting from? What time of day are they visiting? Do we have a history of them or not? And we can combine that with characteristics of the bandit and labels on the bandit and the characteristics of the person visiting to also predict what we know and what we don't know about the footprint. This is an ongoing product, project, and you can find more. Uh, we have slides, we have source code links. Got this page. This happens to be a landing page, which I'm sadly not optimizing. Uh, you, you'll just have to make it a success yourself. But you can send me an email. You can uh, tweet to me. Uh, I'll give you my phone number if you want it. I've got cards up here. And I'd love to have uh, feedback about this. I'd love to have contributions about this. Literally, the code is the, the, the key code, the 10 lines, is the probability distributions are parameterized over here, labels are parameterized over there, the learning algorithm is separate as well. So it's really simple code. And it's really applicable to these real-time learning problems. And it's really no harder, because it comes down to counting, no harder than that real-time counter that we described earlier, which seemed like a pretty boring thing. But now we can do some pretty cool things. That's not the point. Yeah, we've got a lot. You tell me. Okay. Uh, um, we're doing great, I'm saying. We've got all night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> um, I think you have until about 7. Okay. And then uh, then security. We, I, that's when I promise we'll be done. But, okay. Uh, well, we only have uh, okay. questions, questions for 5 or 10 minutes, then we can all hop out. Yeah. Um, so, this is, uh, I have two questions from yeah. Mike, Mike Chung, uh, who's connected in uh, on the webcast here. The first is, uh, since Storm was open source at Strange Loop in 2011, has the, ecosystem, has the ecosystem around Storm uh, matured and developed? Uh, for example, the logger bolt and bolt slides have libraries that have sprung up over the last half year, or are people still writing those logger bolts from scratch each time? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a multi-purpose answer. Uh, the, uh, the community has uh, grown up quite a bit. It's nothing like as large as the Hadoop community. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the camera because the trunk is out there somewhere. Uh, the, uh, the, the community is, is there. There's, according to Nathan, six months ago, there were about two dozen companies that had Storm in production, including Twitter. Uh, Twitter's always a good source of open source because they're pretty open about that sort of thing. They make contributions frequently. Uh, Nathan has been putting in a lot of time there's now a GitHub project called Storm Contrib. Nathan and his minions are keeping pretty tight control over Storm itself. Uh, there are no external committers right at this moment. But he does accept fork requests on GitHub, or pull requests that people can make contributions. And uh, he's very open about contributions to Storm Contrib. I don't think there's a logger bolt per se, but there are various no SQL bolt, there's a timer bolt, there's there's a variety of other things. As these things mature, they'll probably be given to a strong contrib. They're not ready, uh, okay. but they will be. Nathan's in the Bay Area, right? He is. He's I, on I, Twitter. I think he did do a presentation at the Duke User Group out in um, Palo Alto. And he has an astonishing number of presentations. <laughs> I, think, I think I think pretty seen. much good. Okay. Yeah. Um, Two more questions here, right? actually three more. Um, is there, a, this again is from Mike Chung, um, is there a recommended way of getting data into Hadoop from Storm? For example, would you need to connect output from a logger bolt to an ingestion mechanism such as Flume, or perhaps fork the data stream going into a spout to also go to ingestion for later processing? Going into Flume, into Hadoop itself, Apache Hadoop is a difficult thing for the reasons that I mentioned. You don't know what HDFS is going to do. Um, they're just unknowns because there are no guarantees. And the behavior actually changes from version to version. Going into MapR, the method that I recommend is write. You can either open it using HDFS API or you can open it using NFS, but you just write the way you would normally write things. And then you flush them, and they're on the disk. So there's no no magic at all getting the data in. There's no need for 
large frameworks like Flume, which just add more and more uncertainty about them. Uh, there are message passing frameworks. Uh, Flume is dangerous because it doesn't provide guarantees, again, either for transit delay or for losing data. But other things like Kafka do provide uh, guarantees. Orchestral provides slightly weaker guarantees. So we still have a, a, a few more questions that are queued up on the internet, but um, is there anybody in the room? Yay, yay. He's, he's going to bring you the microphone. Yeah. This is an incredibly broad question, but when you've got these um, search engines and these use cases that you mentioned, I'm just curious, what are you seeing uh, from a security standpoint how people are protecting their algorithms and their data sets and their methodologies um, with this type of kind of new, you know, there's a lot of newness here, right? So I'm just wondering what you're seeing, um, particularly around these two use cases, which were interesting. Yeah, that part has to go on if we're going to talk some proprietary right stuff. Um, what we do at NAPR is we, uh, we draw circles around what we super care about what we think is our competitive advantage. And things that are outside the circles, like real-time learning is not our core competency. It's one of the things I do to illustrate our platform. And as such, new technology, and some of this is very new technology. The math was only developed last year. Uh, so some of it's very, very new. But since it's not our core stuff, and because since it's not in the the special circle of, of the file system semantics and, and committing and things like that without locks, we just give it away. I mean, uh, giving stuff out like this makes the world better. So th that's a really simple decision. If, if we need to keep it for proprietary advantage, if it really is our core, we mm -hmm. will consider keeping it proprietary. But outside that, we just assume and pass it around. And so we just worked with a partner uh, who's very conscious of security. They're a financial team. They sent six uh, developers out to our San Jose facility. And that started when I was talking to them and I said, you know, there's really cool algorithms that can make stuff like k nearest neighbor run faster. And they go, yeah. I go, he's a boss. And it turns out they had a project internally. They were really all head up about here's neighbor problems. And so they sent six developers out for two weeks. I worked with them in kind of a scrummy fashion each day. And we built the core of the new nearest neighbor engine. And the clustering part of it alone accelerates the, the Mahout clustering by uh, several orders, 100x, 1000x, something like that. And again, new stuff, new technology, part of it's been published. We developed some very cool stuff. But we gave that out as open source, and the, the bank agreed to do that as well because if we did it in the open, this again is not their core, they'll turn it into interesting core technology inside their system. But by doing it in the open, they can do it much faster. They gain more in time to market than they lose by implementation of published algorithms and non-specific algorithms as well. The, the data problem there was solved by always clustering in the test environment with synthetic data. So we just avoided the, the whole security question by not doing secret things. And they can take the open stuff inside and make secrets out of them. But again, it is important that far. It wasn't core to them to do the mathematics, so it was better to do it in the open. And I think that's a better answer than try to keep everything secret because then we wind up going, ha, 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 I'm going to keep that issue secret from you as if I thought you didn't know about it. This doesn't really as a planet. We just share more around what is not core competency because that's effective. And I think Twitter and Google and Yahoo have demonstrated great examples there. Thanks, uh, sure. Um, so there's still more here. Uh, any, any more questions in here? 
my compliments to the web audience, I must say. <laughs> Unless there's a whole lot of them, their percentage of that question answering is really pretty high. Do you want um, one more? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Are you a security guy yet? <laughs> this is from uh, Shyam Gorsetti. Um, and Shyam asks, um, do you see Storm as supplemental to CET frameworks slash products like Esper or a replacement? Or informatic ultra messaging or any number of things. But what I find Storm is really simple and great for examples because you can explain it quickly. Uh, I think it has promise. Uh, it has pretty high performance. I've seen numbers where small clusters handle a million messages a second. Uh, it has an interestingly different guarantee model. It has guarantees at least once, whereas a lot of things try to do exactly once guarantees, and that makes it much simpler. But I don't know where things are going to go. I just jump on things that look very cool now. Can I ask a question for me? Mm. So, do you see um, MapR developing anything specialized around Storm, uh, specifically working with MapR products? Uh, it already does, but we didn't have to develop anything special. We developed a broad platform, and a lot of things sit on it. And we have a pluggable services architecture. It isn't currently set up to manage Storm, but it could easily manage the Storm workers. But it's no different than job tracker and task trackers. And so that would be supported as well. Well, we probably wouldn't support Storm until it had a bigger audience than that. But, yeah, if I write papers about it or provide the source code, that's kind of a support. It's just not. You can't call us and we guarantee a four hour response on this. So, uh, just in, in keeping to that, um, I've worked with a number of platforms where we worked with them before they were at critical mass and, and before a lot of the uh, related firms were supporting them. Um, in your opinion, what are the indicators that um, basically um, illuminate something as being mainstream, um, as you alluded to right now, by saying, well, we'll support it when? And it, does it, does it, is, is it related to install base? Is it related to maturity of the software? Uh, clearly neither one, uh, really, because a lot of open source stuff in the new ecosystem is not ready for prime time even parts of the projects that I'm involved in. Uh, so it isn't maturity in the code base. And some of them have very obscure audiences. My book is a great example. We have 800 people on the website. We have 5,000 people now who bought the book. But it's still a kind of a small fraction of the universe of people. So it's still very obscure. And we support that in that part. So it, it's a very difficult decision. And it's a business sort of decision a gut feel decision and so will this look cool on the website decision and do people think it's really important and do people do the small number of people care about it care a lot. Right. Is it being addressed by the community? This is all these things go into it. And, and is it probable that existing customers will be adopting it as well? Yeah. yeah. Are people asking about it? Right. Now people are asking about real time a lot, right. not storm in particular. Right. But the, the clearly real time is a big issue. Right. It, it reminds me of HBase, an earlier version of HBase. Nobody would touch it, and, and now it, it seems to be a, a de facto supported. It's not de facto. We support it. We right. absolutely support it. But uh, I think we have to credit Mike Stack for superhuman persistence. He was on that for years. He was. I don't think he was at the first to do user group that we had in Palo Alto, but uh, he was there right around then. Uh, and and he sort of kept at it from totally unacceptable to completely unacceptable to, oh man, I could use this to, could we use that? To, hey, this is getting pretty good. And, you know, since the 0 0.9 series, it's been more and more good. And that's been just a lot of work. And part of it's been the difficulty in the Zoop community because of the lock-in that, that these current frameworks have, the, the way it's so hard to upgrade from one version of the Zoop to another. That's held HBase back. But kudos to him. When we hear HBase rumors coming over here, <laughs> tell me like, do you have a question? Oh, I just, I just wanted to uh, actually 
all bad. Uh, but now people are beginning to run mission critical things, real time things, ish uh, on these clusters. It's getting more scary. Is there anybody here who is, considers themselves to be a Hadoop administrator? Brave man. Brave, brave man. Anybody else? That's real. Oh. That's a lot of long nights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said you have three, you have a lot of long nights. Yeah, that's three, uh, that's three, uh, You said they fixed a lot of a lot of broken data. Uh, sorry, fixing broken nodes and bad data. Yeah. Well, there's, there's or broken data and bad nodes. Yeah. <laughs> Very just interchangeable. Yeah. That's uh, so we're working to make that better, uh, and you know I'm sure the Cloud Air guys are working to make it better in, in their estimation as well. Uh, but it is a big problem because people working on trying to push things as hard as they can. In the time you're pushing hard. Thank you, Racket. Well, so should we uh, break for socialization and let people happy? I think so. So we have about uh, 15 minutes left or so. Uh, if anybody wants to do any networking, please take a hat or two. Uh, thanks to Map Hour for providing the hats. And again, thanks for uh, Map Hour for the pizza and the pop. Uh, and also thanks to Ted. And, and Ted, by the way, everybody on the internet says thank you as well. Oh, that's three different Thank you.